follows. Please welcome on stage the chief guest, Ms. Vidya Gadavari Raju, author Dr. Sheila Nambia and Ms. Renika Jaipal. She is the granddaughter of the royal family of Vijayanagara, passionately involved in sports and fitness. She has been a fitness columnist for the Economic Times, the Madras Press, and many other magazines and papers, and also the brand ambassador for AIDS. Apollo Hospital Center for Excellence, a women's wellness center. She supports many charitable and social causes and has been profiled in several leading Indian magazines and newspapers. She runs Samyo, a wedding planning company based in Chennai, and Senati Events, an <coughs> event management company. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Princess of Vichinagra, entrepreneur and chief guest for the for the evening, Ms. Vidya Gajapati Raju. We welcome you. A small compliment to all the people. She completed her BA English from Etheraj College in 1988 and diploma in MA Commercial in 1989. She was the ex CEO of Ogilvy Group South A Southeast Asia national brand head for Alcel and currently brand and marketing consultant. She also has various positions in her over 25 years experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Renika Jaipal. We welcome you, ma'am. She is a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and a fitness and lifestyle consultant. She holds a certification from the National Association of Fitness Certification USA. She has a obstetric practice in OT and has a wellness fitness program called Training for Life, which she uses as an extension of her medical practice. She also owns and runs the TFL Fitness Studio in Nukapakam, Chennai. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the author of the book, Gain to Lose, Dr. Sina Nadia. I would request Ms. Vidya Kajapati Raju to start today's session by adopting the book. Good evening. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank Sheila for having invited me to, to be so a part of such an important day for her, and it's a huge honor. Also, it's lovely to see so many familiar faces and friends out here. Happy to see all of you. I think Lu there's a famous actress called Lucille Ball who said, uh, the secret to staying, staying young is to live simply, eat sensibly, and then just lie about your age. So I think, uh, I think that's uh, one way to do it. But the other way, of course, is to do what Sheila has been uh, recommending and writing about, is to live a healthy life. I think there can be no shortcuts to that. And um, I, I think most people should realize that he healthy living leads to a healthy body, a healthy mind, and there's a connect between a body and mind. So I think there's no question about it that you need both of them, and one cannot do without the other. You have to do both. 
and a certainly a, a person who does who leads a healthy lifestyle certainly has a, the ability not just to to deliver to be able to uh, to be able to be more productive and also to be able to give your body the tools to fight illnesses but i mean you could step across the road and get hit by a bus that's going to that could happen at any point of time but you need to give your body the tools to to be healthy to stay healthy and to and to fight whatever comes is thrown at us by from the world out there today there's so much going on with pollution and other other things so and i think one of the things which uh, both sheila and i'm sure all three of us recommend is a healthy uh, exercise routine and it's very simple it's it's a very simple mantra eat sensibly and exercise every day i mean i i don't think anyone could put it more simply than that and i think it's something that every single one of us whatever age and age is certainly no bar in any uh, exercise routine i mean you could be my mother is 84 years old and walks every single day drives the car uh, goes in the fields does so this age is certainly not a bar i'm turning 63 and i think i'm the, the fittest that i've been in a very long time maybe more than in my college days when i actually played tennis for the university so uh, i feel i'm fitter now and and feel stronger and better now so i mean this these are these are things that your body can uh, you can help your body by doing all of these things so uh, i you know there's one of the her, her books have been wonderful tools to use whether it was uh, gain to lose the first one uh, sorry the second one and the size get size wise the first one that and uh, Have you had another book before that, or uh, those two? Both are. I'm, I'm sure this is equally equally informative and can help you go in the right direction. Uh, because all of us need a bit of help, I think, uh, to to create that lifestyle for ourselves. And uh, you know, it's it's actually sounds so simplistic, but actually that's what it is. Eat sensibly, exercise every day. How hard can that be? It's not hard. and i think any all three of us here are uh, living examples of how to lead a healthy life i'm sure that i can't having said that i shouldn't say that i'm, I'm not, never going to fall ill i'm sure i'm going to fall ill but my body can fight it and we can actually uh, create a lifestyle which is better for us one of the things a lot of us forget about these days it's all obsession if a kid starts playing tennis his parents want him straight to go to wimbledon whereas uh, even for us nowadays it's an obsession let's go running let's let's go to the gym hit the gym all of it we're forgetting the joy of playing a sport i think that somewhere along the line has kind of slipped between the between the tracks and sport is so much relegated to second place now it doesn't have matter what age you are we have a friend in our in our club where we where we exercise all of us here are in the club and she is about 83 years old still playing tennis she still wears a pair of shorts and plays tennis in the evening i mean that's the way you should be able to do at, be at any point of time in your life so i think having said that i said i mean it's a, a passionate subject for me so I, i don't want to spend the rest of the evening discussing my ideas for exercise but Uh, I think it's a it's a great uh, pleasure to have uh, Sheila here, and we're looking forward to hearing about her book uh, now, and looking forward to reading it as well. Thank you. The breakfast draws the Dr. Sheila Nambiar to say a few words, followed by a conversation with brand and marketing consultant Ms. Neha Chaturvedi. and increase the temperature gradually and the frog doesn't jump out instead it dies when the water gets too hot the frog apparently can adjust its body temperature to the gradually increasing temperature of the surrounding water so it acclimatizes however when the water has reached boiling point it has no energy left 
having used much of that valuable energy to adjust its body temperature to the rising temperature of the water. Acclimatization is a great compliance tactic and is usually, but not always, a good thing. This little story is analogous to the slow weight gain in our own lives. As we age, we gain fat. It's almost a certainty. We all adjust to the changes that come about gradually without clearly registering that we are in fact adjusting to our not necessarily better <coughs> environment and new status, the hotter frog. It happens progressively, two, five, ten kilos a year. We adapt beautifully to the excess baggage. We get used to carrying <coughs> around that extra weight. <clears throat> we buy new clothes to contain our expanding waistline. We move less as the discomfort increases. We devise strategies to accommodate our newfound lack of fitness and wellness. We buy better and fancier cars, use escalators instead of stairs, use more comfortable seats and beds. We play less, preferring instead to watch TV or surf the internet. We invest in the latest time-saving gadgets and devices in order to save us the effort of physical work. Our jobs support us. We're seated most of the day, eyes glued to an inanimate monitor, talking to people, signing papers, writing, talking endlessly on the telephone, stressed out, anxious, multitasking for the most part. We have the food to go with the lifestyle, mindless calorie laden food while at work, which is eaten without registering what goes in, perhaps from a hotel or an office canteen. The choices of cuisine are astounding, each option richer than the next to enhance flavor. Then there are the meetings, dinners, conferences, conventions, with the whining and dining. Every such situation is yet another opportunity to eat and drink quality and indiscriminately. We stumble along convincing ourselves that this is just what we do, such as life. We develop lifestyle-related diseases like diabetes and hypertension. We cope with medication. After all, isn't that what medicines are for? Our blood reports fell through with predictions, inviting more medication to help the high cholesterol, to keep the high cholesterol in check. We make the necessary excuses. We have a master health checkup, which only increases our on the ominous prophecies and ensures more expenditure with drugs and an occasional trip to the fat farm to lose some unwanted kilos which of course promptly pile right back on when we start living in the real world. We consider bariatric surgery. The stress is too much. We see a shrink. We get on antidepressants. So many choices. We adapt. So that sounds rather gloomy, but it doesn't have to be that way. The whole book is about, uh, I've just tried to uh, put together something that has been scientifically proven that weight gain or rather fat gain is not necessarily uh, definite eventuality, there are ways to prevent it and there are ways to get it off and more importantly, keep it off. So, uh, we're going to have a conversation where we're going to ask me a couple of questions and then we'll have, open it out to the audience. If you have questions, we hope to, I hope to uh, clarify a few things. Thank you. Just a few words from you before I sort of cross-examine Sheila. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Sheila for the last 30 years. We were in school together. No, don't do the math. We're not pronouncing our age like Vidya. <laughs> okay. um, back in high school, when I was deciding whether to do arts or commerce and what would involve studying less, Sheila was already really clear that she's going to be a doctor. She went on to become an extremely respected and extremely successful gynecologist. I still can't say the other word. Oh, that one. Um, when she, dealing with women and her patients, she sort of came down this road of uh, embracing fitness and she studied it, she explored it, it resulted, resulted in her first book, in her second book, so I really had the privilege of sort of standing on the sidelines and Cheering, so I'm delighted to be here today to ask her questions about it and to celebrate this wonderful journey. So really my 
first question for you, Sheila, is one that I asked you in the car for the purpose of people here. Uh, you're a successful practicing gynecologist uh, with a very successful hospital in OT. Uh, you have uh, set up this incredible, you, you suddenly moved to a fitness center which resulted in uh, book number one and book number two. Now, uh, literally and figuratively, uh, it's an incredibly long road. What what made you take it? Uh, long road, yeah, you take into consideration the number of years, which again we won't go into. But uh, uh, to me, it seems a very natural continuum to go from treating disease to preventing disease. And I think fitness is one of those uh, uh, things that very clearly prevent many of the lifestyle diseases that we actually see and treat. Uh, and so fitness, uh, I, I use fitness as a part of my practice simply to improve the quality of life for uh, women, not just treat the disease once it happens. So it seems very natural. It's not such a, 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 a natural thing to go from being a doctor to also encompassing fitness. OK, my next question, possibly inappropriate, but here goes. Uh, there are gyms, there are studios, there are fitness pads. Uh, people lose weight, people get fitter, etc. Uh, what's different about your approach? What sets you apart? See, gym, a gym is just a place to train. It's got equipment, it's got the machines. It's just a place where one goes to train. What one does there and the kind of training that is imparted comes with a certain science. And I do believe that one needs quite an in-depth understanding of the human body to be able to uh, understand that not everybody can and should do the same thing. It has to be, uh, to a certain extent, personalized to the person involved. And having known women inside and out, quite literally, uh, for, this, for so many years, I think my understanding of the human body, the woman's body, is a little better than, uh, you know, so, and I try and apply that in, in regular practice because somebody, for instance, uh, uh, somebody who's a surgeon <coughs> is not necessarily going to want to or need to work out the way a sports person does or someone who is not working because time, the, the time factor, the kind of uh, work she does, everything needs to be taken into account. The number of hours she's going to be standing at surgery, so therefore giving her the necessary exercises to circumvent some of the problems that come with standing those long hours. So it takes a little bit more than just going to the gym and doing a few bicycles or running on the treadmill. Um, in your first book, uh, Get Size Wise, you speak at length about the four pillars of fitness, as she made it, there's proof. Uh, stamina, strength, flexibility and endurance. In the second book, which I have also read, uh, in Gain to Lose, you have deep dived into the second pillar, um, strength. Why, why is that? Um, you see, to me, uh, most people are looking at weight loss. And the common misconception is that the way to go with weight loss, for weight loss, is cardio. Uh, cardio and dieting. Uh, of course, that will cause weight, uh, weight loss, it will, most definitely will, but the, the more important question is, will it sustain that weight loss and will it also improve the quality of your body? Oh. Uh, and uh, one of the reason I stress on strength and muscle mass in this book, second book is that there's been a lot of research that tells us that the Indian body uh, Indian women have less muscle mass than our Caucasian counterparts, and we are at a disadvantage to start with. One of the reasons why we tend to gain a lot of weight, uh, especially around the abdomen, and the way, the, one of the only ways to prevent that is to build more muscle. muscle. And uh, the way to do that is strength training, either using your own body weight or your, or uh, preferably starting with external weights and then moving on. So this book is specifically about preventing uh, weight gain, the boiling frog, and also to achieve weight, fat loss by building muscle and sustaining that fat loss once you've achieved it. Also, I think uh, I think also uh, muscle. If, uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you know it. You say it, but 
Muscle also is far more efficient in burning calories, yes. burning fat than um, any other uh, okay. So that's why a, body, a person who's thin doesn't necessarily burn the same amount of fat as um, a same amount of calories as a person who has um, a body which doesn't have as much muscle or more muscle. I don't know if I said it right. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, just to build on what you're saying, uh, I found sadly that uh, a person who's thin is not necessarily a person who's fit. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? And most thin people don't take fitness very seriously because one of the main objectives of exercising is weight loss. So they feel that they don't need to lose weight and therefore they don't. So one, some of my most resistant clients are the thin ones. <laughs> also, I think people get terrified of, of, of building bulky, muscles bulky. because they think they're going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. <laughs> and there's no way anybody here is going to look like that, however much weight you, you uh, lift. Yeah. Okay, as a woman on the wrong side of 40, extremely wrong actually, uh, I've never done this. I've never weight trained. Is it too late to, to start and um, what are the implications? What's, what do I have to do? No, it's never, never too late. We've had, uh, I've had clients starting at 70. So it's never too late to start. It, it all depends on the kind of, on the, it is, uh, it depends on the kind of training. It's about easing into it in a, in a, Uh, in fact, uh, two of my most consistent, disciplined clients are almost 80. Oh, I'm sorry, they're 80 plus. They're not here, unfortunately. They couldn't come here. Sorry, I'm sorry. I think just repeat that. I'm trying to sort of rock stylish towards your back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I was just saying that two of my most disciplined clients are 80 plus. Uh, they couldn't be here, but they are uh, uh, clear testimony to me. Training with weights definitely helps you lead a better quality life. My mom, who's almost 80, has been training. She doesn't listen to me too much, but she has been trying to train and uh, toe the line. So it's never too late, really. Oops, okay. Um, so I train, and, and I, um, I'm, I'm one of the thin ones, I train. Actually, real fear of training, and you were talking about this earlier, with there's, uh, yeah, you don't want sort of the biceps and triceps, you just want the flat stomach and everything else to stay, you know, the way it is. So what's the chance, and seriously speaking, what is the chance of getting bulky enough, getting muscular? You, as a woman, you don't get muscular and uh, muscular. That's, that's, uh, that comes with hormones, not with weight training. So the, if I mean, you're afraid of, you just... If you're afraid of, uh, if you're afraid of growing facial hair and uh, deepening voice, no, that won't happen. Uh, muscular, masculine, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, that takes a completely different kind of training routine. They train. Uh, I think looking at pictures of uh, women bodybuilders who are extremely muscular, very well defined, uh, with very very little body fat percentage, probably about eight six or eight, uh, most women get a bit scared to start training. What they don't understand is those women spend hours training with very heavy weights and in addition they also follow a very specific stringent diet, not to mention supplements. Many of them do go on steroids and other supplements. So no, you won't look like, uh, look, look like them. Uh, what will happen is a better, a more toned and more defined body provided you also lose the fat over the muscles. So the definition comes when you lose the fat over the muscles. So it's a combination of building the muscle and burning the fat over the muscle. But masculine, no, I don't think that's possible. And you are just me to that, aren't you? Yeah, I think. Okay, um, another one. I haven't worked out yet, uh, but I have been to Sheila's studio and had a cup of coffee there. And uh, the coffee mug, the coffee mug says, it's sort of um, almost confusing. It says, uh, I'm not what happened to me, I am what I choose to be. And I think that's sort of a mantra that was slightly unforgiving in my opinion, but a mantra that you live by, isn't it? You, in chapter 22, uh, it's titled, Only You Are Responsible For You. I, I lost to admit really fast. 
but uh, yeah, that, 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 that quote is by Carl Jung, and it is definitely something that I believe in. We are the result of the choices that we make, however much we like to blame destiny and you know our genes and all of that. Uh, we definitely are the result, especially in the field of uh, health and fitness and weight. Uh, there is this amazing field called epigenetics, which uh, touches upon our non-DNA inheritance, where even though you have a propensity for diabetes and obesity, if you make the right lifestyle choices, uh, changes can come about in your body right from the cellular level right from the, the, the DNA of the cells are altered if you make the right uh, lifestyle choices. So it's not just that you look better and feel better, you are better from within and in fact this can be even propagated to your progeny. So it's not necessary that uh, your inheritance of bad genes, quote unquote bad genes, has to be continued to your children. So yeah, you are the result of your choices. I have a, a little point here now. What happens if genetically uh, each person is built differently? And some, some of us are a bit larger. We have families that come from larger sizes. Some of us grow up skinny. Our families, our parents are skinny. So there is some... Yeah, there, there is some definitely a different... A different level. Level. Yeah, there is. I mean, I can't hope to look, grow as tall as we Yeah. So uh, it's... It, I mean, <laughs> this is... That is... I'll go to you. That is the uh, thing. But... There is a certain amount that you can control in terms of the amount of muscle you build, for instance, and the amount of fat that you carry around. Although you have a propensity, using the right lifestyle changes, you can make the necessary changes within your body, within reason, within reason. I, I really liked this, uh, there's a section in your book, just to build on what you're saying, it's not a question, it's a comment, is, you said when you work out or when you're uh, sort of, working at fitness, you're actually working at being your best self, not someone else's version of you. And that's something we have talked about right here. The best version of yourself. The best version of Although I must say that a lot of a lot of women don't necessarily want to be the best version of or they don't start off wanting to be the best version of themselves. They want to look like somebody else. They want to have that flat stomach, that those slim thighs. They start off like that. And then you they kind of understand that no, you can't be that person. You have to be the best possible version of yourself, which is a constant, constant state of improvement and progress. Okay. People, I kid you not, there is a whole chapter titled Fluffy the Fat Cell. Does it really exist medically? <laughs> well, I named him Fluffy. Okay. But uh, yes, the fat cells, not fatty, fluffy. Okay. And uh, yes, of course, the fat cell does exist. And it resides in the, what we call the adipose tissue. And the whole chapter just tells us the journey that this fat cell undergoes to be utilized as fuel. As, uh, because fat is basically what is what the body fat and glucose um, is what the body uses for fuel to function. And fat happens to be the preferred fuel for muscle. So although muscle uses glucose when doing high intensity activities, most lower intensity, longer duration activity is uh, is propelled by fat as fuel. And this chapter talks about the fat cell that goes into the blood vessels when the muscle starts working and calls, calls upon the fat cell, goes into the blood vessels and then gets into the muscle and then in the muscle it goes into the powerhouse of the muscle or the mitochondria and then breaks down there to become ATP in order to produce energy. So what this actually means is that if you have a lot of muscle, you will be calling upon more fat to work and therefore burning more fat. So that's why the whole story about because I was trying to convince I was trying to convince women that muscle is very important in burning fat. The more muscle you have, the greater your chances of burning fat. That's why fluffy uh, the whole story. <laughs> I actually had a series of pictures which I had drawn myself. But my publisher wasn't very impressed with my artwork. So let me just get that out. <laughs> okay. Uh, you again grabbed my uh, attention in the chapter titled Weight Training, the Anti Aging Quill. And I think uh, you give us standing testimony to the fact that it's true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so so that's, that's a big one. I mean, yeah. weight training, anti aging. Can you elaborate a little bit yeah. on that? 
um, going through a little bit of science, there was a study that was done uh, in Australia which uh, took uh, two groups of uh, people, uh, one set that was older and the other group that was much younger, and put them through a series of uh, weight training uh, uh, for, a, for a period of about six weeks. Uh, muscle biopsies were taken before the training and after six weeks. And when they actually studied those biopsies, they found that, um, I, I said, mentioned this before, the actual DNA of the muscle cells were altered. So it was the change came about right from that level after just six weeks of training. So I'm talking about, that's what I mean by anti-aging. The, the muscle seems to have grown, the cells of the muscle seems to have grown younger. So besides looking younger, weight training definitely makes one look more because it, it, what the word that's commonly used is tone, you know, and it's actually a misnomer. But uh, yeah, you do look tone, you do look firmer. Uh, fat doesn't hold up to gravity very well. So any area in your body that has a lot of fat tends to sag uh, with age. But if you have more muscle, because it's adherent to the bone and the tissues around it, it doesn't sag, and the youthfulness of the body is maintained. So there is the the physiological aspect of it, and there is the, uh, you know, the visual aspect, the cosmetic, which I think most people are more concerned about. Nobody's bothered about DNA and the molecule. <laughs> <laughs> we just, we just want to look good. Just look good and fit into the right clothes. So. Uh, this is really my last question. You close your book with, uh, with an intriguing Japanese ideology of uh, wabi-sabi which says uh, nothing is perfect, uh, nothing is permanent, and nothing is finished. So what's the point, Sheila? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's what most people ask. It is, uh, when you look superficially, you wonder like, what's the point, since nothing's permanent, nothing is finished. I, I, I find that uh, whole Japanese philosophy very fascinating, but the, the, the point is that if nothing is perfect, uh, there are two things to it. One is that there is this myth of perfection. Uh, you know, we all want to look like the girl on the magazine cover. Even she doesn't look like herself, like the girl on the magazine cover. So it's all Photoshop. So uh, this whole myth of uh, perfection, which is propagated by the fashion industry, is something that a lot of women seek to achieve. So there is nothing that is perfect. And because there's nothing that's perfect, it's only it's only right that we should work towards bettering ourselves. And because something is not permanent, so you're not going to be young for the rest of your life. You're not going to have that 24 inch waist, at least not all of us. So you still have to work towards uh, bettering yourself, if not maintaining that 24 inch waist, maintaining a certain semblance of uh, normal normalcy. And nothing is finished, so you don't. You don't, uh, you know, lose 10, you start off a program saying I want to lose 10 kilos. So what happens when you stop, when you achieve your goal? Uh, do you stop training? Do you, do you decide that, okay, that's the end of my goal? Uh, no, you do, you do move on because it's, you're not a finished product. A human body is never a finished product. So to me that those three terms, nothing is permanent, nothing is perfect, nothing is finished, epitomizes, I think, what fitness should be all about because I find that most women uh, focus purely on weight gain, or sorry, weight loss, uh, and there is disappointment and there is uh, frustration because they're not achieving that weight loss and they're not seeing that scale move. If you have other goals like improvement of fitness, uh, let's say covering a distance of let's say a mile in a shorter time, lifting a heavier weight, uh, getting stronger and all these other goals and following a diet which is quite very important. If you have all those goals also in place and you manage to achieve 50 to 60 percent of your goals, that's success. So you're not focusing to only on that number on the scale which can be extremely frustrating when that scale doesn't move. That's one of the reasons I think we need to defocus from this whole concept of perfection and all of that and focus more about fitness from a more holistic perspective to better ourselves rather than just the um, scale. I think one of the one of the things that uh, you know through her books and through your own personal experience is that feeling of well being. And what is that feeling of well being? It is the physiological changes that come in your body while you're exercising. Yeah. 
And these, these are caused through endorphins, adrenaline that comes to your body, endorphins that are released while you're exercising. So it's that feeling of, actually you get a, what they call the runner's high, that actually comes through any exercise. You feel wonderful after a workout, you go for a swim, you feel great, go, go for a run, you feel wonderful. It's from these endorphins. And it's actually a chemical reaction in the body, I'm, so, I'm sure Sheila will, will uh, endorse that. And uh, I think this is one of the things that gives you that feeling of well-being, which keeps want, making you want to go back and exercise more and keep regular with it. Comment on that? Absolutely, that is, uh, it is true. It's about the, it's almost addictive, you know. It's one of those addictions that, not almost, it is addictive. It is absolutely addictive because people, those of us who exercise regularly do feel completely out of sorts when we haven't exercised on a regular, you know, a couple of days. Uh, we get back there and do something, if not everything. So it is definitely addictive because that feeling of well-being takes you through the next 24 hours to your next fix. So uh, that's that's the uh, you know thing about exercise fitness. I'm uh, I'm done with my questions. Honestly, Sheila, this was uh, a really motivating book to read. More than anything else, you have a very practical approach to it. So it's like. Forget a crash diet, for example. You you have clearly have contempt for crash diets or sort of short-term solutions. As you said, it's a journey. Uh, so a, a lot of what is in Sheila's book is a bit practical take on exercise that regular people with kids and jobs can keep up, and and uh, that that's what really worked for me in it. Um, maybe we can open the floor up for some questions, please. Audience. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for questions. Do raise your hand if you would like to ask a question so we can get the mic to you. Two servings, cooked rice, one cup is two servings, and they're like, two servings, 
you know, but the, the point is that you're filling up with other things like the vegetables and the protein. You know, the rice is not your main, uh, main, the main part of your meal. So that is uh, one of the things that we need to do. And I think we also just eat too much. You know, we just eat too much because there's so much, so much food available, and there's so many options, and our whole life revolves around food. Every time you go visit somebody, there's food and they're forcing it down your throat and you get upset if you don't, if you don't need it. Uh, there's just too much. It's just too much work. <laughs> like backaches and that sort of thing. Do you um, talk about that uh, in yeah. terms of exercise yeah, and yeah, you know yeah. what we're allowed to do and what we're not? Yeah. Well, I talk about what, what you do to prevent it in the first place. Okay, excellent. So, because pregnancy does cause certain malalignments that can later on lead to uh, back pain. So most women who go through their pregnancy, they end up with back pain and you know, And then most women who gain a lot of weight end up with uh, back pain. So you can prevent it in the first place, and that is the key, uh, the key, the, the key uh, uh, solution to preventing it is strength training or weight training. Cardio is not going to cut it. It's the weight training because it trains specific muscles that are if unbalanced uh, in order to bring it back to the right kind of alignment and sort out your back pain. And if you've been starting it before as a form of prevention, then strengthening those muscles would have prevented your back pain for the, in the first place. That's why weight training is so important. So it's not just about, I mean, the, the, the title gain to lose was an essential guide to losing fat by gaining muscle was to make people, you know, because everybody is interested in losing fat. So it's to make people pick up the work. But really, weight training is a lot more than just losing fat. It prevents all these problems that you just asked me about. You actually have a great example about circus tent and how it's built. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah the core, if you imagine a circus tent, for instance, you have the central pole, and then you have the little guy ropes, is what they're called, to uh, attach to the periphery. Now, unless that central pole is strong and stable and straight, you'll find that the whole tent is skewed either way. And which is what happens to our body, unless the core and the strength is there, the muscles in the core of our body are very strong, we are going to be in balance in the way that one muscle, or, uh, you see most muscles exist in pairs. Uh, so one of them could be slightly weaker, causing uh, you know, postural problems, which again lead to pain and uh, you know, discomfort. So training the core, training the larger muscles, and then moving on to the peripheral muscles is a very important component. Not just fat gain, but pain and uh, postural problems as well. Another question, Sheila. You, you have a studio uh, in Chennai, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. in Nungumba. In yeah. and you and you run sort of. I, I yeah, uh, I, I'm here once in about four to six weeks. Sometimes I don't get to come in four to six weeks, but I have trainers and manager here, so they take you through, it's a proper studio with, with uh, equipment and all of that. Okay. Uh, and I meet with the clients when I do come down okay. and then change their routine and uh, or if necessary, you know, counsel them and whatever it takes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, that's the right. I'm glad you stand on this uh, full of thought that believes that uh, obesity and insulin resistance are one and the same. And uh, what are your thoughts on a low carbohydrate, high fat, high protein diet? High fat, high protein diet. Yeah. No, you, you asked me another question? Yeah, two questions. Obesity together. and uh, insulin, resistance insulin resistance being one insulin and the same. Insulin resistance, obesity, all of them come, come under a certain syndrome or metabolic syndrome. They are one and the same. It's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that everyone with insulin resistance needs to be obese. It doesn't necessarily follow that everyone who's obese will be insulin resistant. But a combination of insulin resistance and uh, obesity 
comes down, uh, uh, is called metabolic syndrome. And to answer your second question, high fat, high protein, uh, what uh, Professor Noakes uh, uh, propagates, I think it's very hard to follow in the Indian scenario, especially the vegetarians. It's really hard to go as far as he talks about, you know, because we don't have, we don't eat that much meat. Uh, and so getting all your nutrition from protein would be hard. But you can modify it to the extent where you keep your pro your uh, bread cereal to the minimum and increase your pr uh, fruits and vegetables and protein options for you. I don't think we can go, you know, high protein to the extent that he's talking about. But I do agree that we can need to increase our uh, good fat. I mean, the good quality fats like our, you know, your uh, sun, your uh, olive oil and uh, uh, cold pressed refined oil, uh, brown nut oil and all of that, increase that and decrease the processed food. Decrease food that's packaged, just decrease food that has a whole lot of preservatives. Try and eat clean, you know, wholesome food that is prepared then and there and, uh, you know, rather than eating out of uh, uh, packets and uh, so Basically, if you eat anything that is not advertised, then you're eating, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> going back to food for the main uh, The first part of the question is, do you believe that food can be healing? And the second part is, coming from a medical background like you have, uh, you have a certain system that you follow, a scientific system in terms of food. Uh, so then, would you believe in grandmother's uh, food habits? Like, for example, my mother would say that in December, you eat certain fruits and vegetables and you eat certain foods and certain millets which you don't eat in the summer. So if you are coming from a medical background, if you do believe in that, how do you balance that out? See, first of all, coming from a medical background, that you're telling your child to do something that you are not doing and you're not following, definitely the parents are responsible. And the teachers to some extent, if the teachers are following the, the what they say, the teachers and parents for sure. Also, I think a lot of times as women who uh, bring up children, nurturing and looking after the home, a lot of times the choice of what goes on the table comes through us. So I think it's up to us to try and create the right kind of uh, food that the kids can eat. It's not that hard to make the right choices. It's not that hard, but the problem is that they, they don't understand food. Most people don't understand food. So they, uh, they do, and they don't take the trouble to understand it. So they just, you know, eat what's advertised, like you said, and they, you know, so they, they don't even know the food groups, for instance, which is really not that difficult to understand once you, uh, you know, look at it, look at that pyramid and say, yeah, this, is, this belongs to this group. This is a protein as opposed to, this is a carbohydrate. They don't even know that difference. So then what are you going to put on the table? You know, so it takes a little bit of effort uh, to understand that and I think that's the key to sustaining a healthy lifestyle rather than, like she said, crash diets or crash, you know, uh, short, short diets which may cause weight loss but then how do you sustain it? You can't sustain a diet like that. So if you make it into a lifestyle, it becomes uh, slightly more sustainable. I think I, the other thing I've seen aggravate you is when you're talking to your patients or your clients and... Uh, I'm not aggravated. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, the very balanced Sheila sort of responds uh, a little strongly when people say, I don't have the time. Come on, that aggravates yeah, it. Yeah, that does, that does. Because I think that's really a choice. That's really a choice. You have to make the choice between... I understand you may not have time all the time, but to say, I don't have time to exercise is really, really not uh, not on because you make the choice between watching that television or chatting on the telephone and or going to a movie. That's a choice that you make. So it's the same thing. You make a choice. But then 20 minutes is all that you need. If that's all, I mean, 20 minutes in 24 hours. So that's not really asking for too much. And if you can't get to the gym, then again, the choice you make is you do it at home. So you, you need to have those options available to you because only you know your schedule and can I get to the gym and how far is the gym and all of that. So saying, oh, you know, I can't get to the gym because it's too far away is not good enough. Yes, sir. Uh, 
just uh, I don't know more than book a walk. You don't even need to be a member of a gym. There's a lovely walking areas in every city. You just put on a pair of shoes. I don't know. Go for a walk. Just staying on the previous comment that Dina uh, mentioned, uh, I just like to mention to Sheila that any time I think I don't have time, I remember what you said that if I have time, you definitely have time because you know with running with uh, your hospital and also your studio here, I'm sure you do a lot more than I do. So I always remember what she said that you know if I have time, anybody else can do it. So. Any more questions? Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of Origi and Dupa Publications, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Chief Guest Ms. Vidya Gadavati Raju, Dr. Sheila Nambia, and Ms. Renika Jaipal for being here with us this evening. We would also like to thank all of you for making this evening memorable. We hope you have enjoyed the event as we have done hosting it. In the meanwhile, copies of the books are available for sale. Please bring your copies before having them autographed. Thank you.